So there's also a list of people here that have uh, acknowledged um, that I'll be mentioning as we go through this talk. They've contributed various um, materials and ideas uh, to the content. Uh, okay, so I'm talking about long time scale geomagnetic variations. So I'm referring to here variations in time scales of 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 9 years. Um, so what I'll uh, do, what I'll be covering is uh, kind of a review of the different tools that we have as paleomagnetists uh, to uh, characterize these variations. Um, I'll be talking about some paleo intensity studies that recently I've been personally involved in. And I'll be talking about some potential implications of those, uh, future research directions, and, um, and possible plans. Okay. Sorry. How do I change slides? Um, okay, so in a very fortunate position uh, in Liverpool to. Uh, uh, to be able to make some some real plans for research. Um, so I don't know if you have this same phrase in the um, in the states that you wait for ages for a bus to turn up and then two come along at once. But essentially, that's uh, that's what's happened here with uh, with research funding. Um, so myself and co-eyes Richard Holm, uh, Chris Davies, Mark Hanslow, and a bunch of project partners from around the world. Sam, we received uh, funding from the uh, Natural Environment Research Council and the Levy Hume Trust um, to really uh, uh, delve into these long time scale variations. And um, yeah, the Levy Hume Trust kind of required us to come up with a snappy logo and, uh, and uh, name for the new research group at Liverpool. So we're deep, determining Earth evolution from paleomagnetism. So the overarching aim to advance the SETI application of paleomagnetism. So uh, SETI, of course, is study of the Earth's deep interior. There's um, an AGU focus group with that name, highly multidisciplinary, um, but I think could stand to use, uh, to make more use of, of paleomagnetism. Uh, so I put up here the motivating questions um, for the group, and I'll only really be covering um, number two and number three in this talk, but just point out that these are really SETI questions, research questions. So the first two don't even mention paleomagnetism or the, uh, um, or the Earth's magnetic field. In okay, so in terms of the tools that we have to, um, to study long time scale variations, so I've identified three main ones. Uh, I'll be taking you through each one of these in terms, discussing various uh, advantages and disadvantages of each. Okay, so clarity reversal frequency, this is just saying something about the average number of reversals that's occurred in a certain time period, it's only a million a year. Um, advantages, so it doesn't require precise paleomagnetic data, so it needs reliable data, you need to be able to demonstrate that the um, uh, that the samples that you're studying are uh, uh, retaining a primary magnetization. Um, but in terms of how precisely you need to know the direction, the polarity uh, will suffice. Uh, we can piggyback um, on uh, the back of other studies that are using magnetostratigraphy. So it has very diverse applications well outside of geomagnetism. Um, so, and then, um, tend to compile these multiple magnetostratigraphic studies into polarity timescales, and then it's a relatively trivial matter to, uh, to then extract reversal frequency uh, signal from that. And then finally, I guess the main advantage, show unambiguous variations on these timescales, tens to hundreds of millions of years. So I've just got an example here from Cotillo and, and Olsen um, showing the three uh, phanerozoic um, supercrons and intervals between these with uh, relatively uh, rapidly uh, reversing field. Uh, disadvantages, um, so your recorders need to be continuous in nature. So essentially that means in practice that uh, prior to um, 
build this oceanic crust in the Jurassic, you're essentially reliant on sedimentary uh, rocks because uh, you need to be sure that you're not missing polarity. Points. Uh, it requires good relative age constraints, of course, because you need to know how long the period is that you have these vessels uh, in. And this brings in another big practical limitation, uh, which is that um, uh, reversal frequency is primarily a um, Panerozoic uh, signal um, because back in the Precambrian, you don't have fossils for the biostratigraphy. So there have been some studies that have attempted to estimate reversal frequency in the, in the Precambrian, but one here um, from the early Mesoproterozoic in North America, one here from the late Mesoproterozoic in Siberia. In both cases, um, uh, they're arguing for uh, supercrons and periods of, of rapid, uh, rapid reversals, hyperactivity, um, but it's really only um, qualitative inferences that are making it. It's very different, difficult to come out with quantitative uh, estimates of reversal frequency because we're reliant on very patchy and sometimes rather imprecise uh, radiometric dates. Okay, and final disadvantage linked to other aspects of geodynamo, not straightforward. So um, reversal is, of course, very, very interesting phenomena, um, but also extremely rare. So extreme events in the core are spaced by a few hundreds of thousands of years, and the turnover time of the core is just a few thousand uh, years. So it's not necessarily um, trivial then to relate that to the day-to-day -day, um, activities of the, of the geodynamo. Okay, paleosecular variation. So here I'm referring to um, measures, quantitative measures of the, the dispersion, the angular dispersion or scatter of clouds of directions or of their associated poles, virtual geomagnetic poles. Um, so basically the width of distribution such as seas. Um, so these don't require continuous recorders. So you can use um, Lava successions, for example, that have uh, produced intermittent uh, directions. Um, they don't require very precise age constraints um, because essentially you can. You need to be sure that you're producing a time average, um, but you don't. You don't need to say much more than that. Um, again, we can piggyback on the back of studies with a different primary objective. So, lava successions, dike swarms, studied to produce. Um, Paleomagnetic poles for paleogeographic reconstructions, and um, tectonic studies, and if they're high quality, if we've got enough data, then we can use the, um, the, the signal from those to estimate paleosecular variation. And final thing, provide strong evidence for very long time scale variations. So I feel somewhat confident in, uh, in making that claim because we've got three uh, independent groups. The data sets aren't independent, unfortunately, but the groups are independent. Uh, all arguing for the first, for the same first order uh, variations in paleosecular variation through uh, through Earth history. So essentially, saying that um, since the late Archean, the magnetic field appears to have been become uh, less stable in time. Uh, so normally we report these values for GPM dispersion or scatter um, on a plot like this against the the paleo latitude. And, um, <coughs> we can see that these, at least at low latitudes, are tending uh, towards higher values uh, as we go through time. Now, the details of when exactly transitions occurred uh, and the implications of those in history, that's still up for grabs, but the first order um, uh, suggestion that the magnetic field is, is gradually destabilizing over a very long time period, so I'd say that's fairly uh, robust. Okay, disadvantages of paleo Secular variation. Well, of course, you're measuring the scattering data, and your data can be scattered for, uh, for just a simple reason of, of measurement noise. So you need to try and get a handle on that and extract what is the geomagnetic signal. And again, this has a, a practical uh, ramification, which is uh, that really it makes sediments very difficult um, to work with, extract reliable records uh, from, because it's very difficult with sediments to really um, uh, get reproducible estimates of exactly the same same time period and see what scatter is there from just from the measurements. So lava flows, dike swarms, they tend to make um, better targets because you can 
resample the same um, uh, the same uh, time uh, snapshot in time uh, with multiple samples. Um, you need to be aware of serial correlations. So larvas um, erupting within very short time periods of one another. Uh, take that into account, and we need to be careful with intrusives, especially of temporal averaging, that we're not smoothing out the record by, re by um, recording, uh, integrating over variation of, of, let's say, a few thousand years. Uh, it's not clear how to parameterize the scatter, so we've kind of got into the habit of using BGP um, angular dispersion, but there have been some um, arguments made that it's, it might not always be the best uh, parameter to use, and the alternatives are suggested, and uh, whatever you use, you've always got the problem with outliers. How do you deal with outliers? Um, and finally, at this point, the inversion is, is highly non-unique. So what, what do these, these scatter curves, what do they actually mean in terms of the uh, uh, geomagnetic field behavior, in terms of the individual spherical harmonic uh, components? So originally, um, back in the 80s, Bill McFadden um, pointed out that the uh, the scatter curve for uh, the last five million years was very similar to the then present day um, scatter curve that's obtained by, ge uh, by geographical averaging from 1980 and argued that there's some equivalence there and that perhaps we could use the same, um, same power spectrum to, to extract information. Um, but then um, Julio and Gale pointed out sometime later that actually you need to go back a couple of centuries and you see that that uh, apparent equivalence uh, it disappears. Okay, now we get on to paleo intensity. So I've got to admit this coming up with this slide made me pause slightly. I'm not used to writing nice things about paleo intensity. Uh, <laughs> thinking advantages. Um, so it was good. It was, it, was a, it was a healthy exercise to think actually, why do we pour all that blood, sweat, and tears into, uh, in, into uh, recovering these, uh, these estimates? Um, and yeah, there's a very good reason at the top. It's a fundamental geomagnetic property, the strength of the magnetic fields, uh, any one time and place. In the direction of the magnetic fields, you could also say is a fundamental property, but in terms of these long time scale variations, we're not really interested in, in the direction on its own, we're interested in the variability of, that, of, of those directions. Now, Pele intensities are also interested in the variability um, <clears throat> of the intensity, but just the number itself and the, the average, time average of the intensity is, is, is something very valuable uh, to us as well. Okay, so normally uh, paleo intensities are converted into virtual dipole moments or virtual axial dipole moments under the dipole assumption or the axial dipole assumption. Uh, how good is that? Well, um, I get handled this. I've plotted what the VDMs would be uh, for the present day um, fields from various places uh, around, the, around the world. Uh, so clearly there's only a single dipole moment. Um, one time, but we have a range of virtual dipole moments, plus minus 50%. Um, but what is encouraging is a very sharp spike of around the correct value. Um, over here, this is a geodynamo simulation. This was run a few years ago by Neil Sutty at Liverpool, and um, we have dipole moments, or axial dipole moment, and blue line here. And down here, we're um, at each um, time slice where picking 10 random locations on the globe and um, measuring the, vir the virtual dipole moment. We can see, of course, there's some smearing, but generally the um, uh, evolution is, is fairly well tracked. And in terms of the total um, uh, distributions from here, so axial dipole moment, virtual axial dipole moment, you can see there's some smoothing, we're losing the very low values. Some of them, uh, we're adding in a high tail, but overall we're capturing the evolution, uh, sorry, the, the overall distribution reasonably well, and that's true for dipole moment and virtual dipole moment as well. Okay, disadvantages. This is an easy, an easy slide to make. So, um, okay, here we can't piggyback on um, other studies because paleo intensity is not really that much use apart from studying the, the magnetic field. Um, so we need to do our own experiments there. Um, and these are extremely time consuming and have high failure rate, um, tend to have a very high failure rate. Um, now, just for the uninitiated, there's, there's a huge range of different techniques that we can use to measure the paleo intensity. Most of them boil down to simply comparing 
uh, what we hope is an ancient uh, TRM thermoremagnetization with a new um, TRM acquired in laboratory under controlled conditions. Okay, there are many potential sources of measurement bias, a huge number, and the problem is that we keep on discovering new ones all the time as well. So uh, yeah, it's, it's really quite a challenge. And that's compounded by the fact that unlike the directional studies, we don't have classical field tests like the conglomerate test, or the fold test, reversal tests, and so on. Um, and then a final uh, problem that we have is that if we really want to see changes in uh, the dipole moment, um, on very long time scales, um, then we need a lot of data. So, um, for example, this so this is again geodynamo simulation um, or two geodynamo simulations we did, where we changed the um, the dipole moment uh, by 25 percent, and we looked at how many um, data we would need from which locations, how many locations, um, to avoid a type two error. So a uh, not rejecting, uh, failing to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis was, was in fact invalid. Um, so normally we'd use something like the uh, called Mogorov Smirnov uh, non-parametric uh, test for equality distributions and turn on that. And turns out for this 25% um, uh, change in the dipole moment to get down to kind of below 90% uh, sorry, 10%, 5% um, uh, chance of, um, of observing uh, or missing this uh, the shift, we need well in excess of 100 um, specimens from each time interval. So this is not to say that if you don't have 100 specimens, you can't infer that the dipole moment has changed. It's just to say that if you have fewer than those, you may well be missing something if it's, uh, even if it's there. But if type one errors, I've got a slide on that, but I'll save that for a quiz question. Okay, so the reliability is the big problem. I uh, kind of glossed over that earlier. Um, and I see two main strategies or two end member strategies um, for making progress despite this issue. Um, so let's go through with these. Then I'd just say at the, the outset, both of these I regard as completely valid and worth pursuing um, in uh, uh, simultaneously. Yeah, the first one, keep pushing for greater understanding while developing um, methods or sample targets that attempt to remove all known sources of bias. So that is really kind of zooming in on just the most reliable stuff. And um, it's certainly worthwhile, um, but it has some associated problems with it. So first is that this is essentially what we've been doing as a community for, for decades. And um, our progress has been, has, has been uh, demonstrable, but has been very, very small. And we're still now, I would argue, in a situation where there is not a single published paleo intensity estimate from an ancient rock that everyone would agree is 100% reliable, uh, or even arguably that most people would agree. Um, so, how long are we going to have to wait before finding this, this holy grail? And uh, what can we be doing in the meantime? And the other uh, problem is that just say if uh, where we do have the more reliable methods, more reliable samples, it tends to be quite restrictive uh, in, in terms of either uh, the equipment that's available or the availability of the materials to measure or the time it takes to produce the measurements. So then producing, you know, so answering questions like is there is the was the dynamo open running, uh, that might be doable. But for other questions, really tracking tracking dipole moment evolution, that becomes extremely uh, would become extremely challenging. Okay, so that brings us to uh, the other end of the strategy two, which is to filter out the least reliable data. So get rid of the junk, um, check where the remainder makes sense in some way, and then use them to make hypotheses so we accept may be incorrect. And then they can be tested by better data coming from uh, as a result of strategy one in the future. Um, so this also has its own problems. Uh, how do we gauge reliability in the least controversial way? Um, because there's lots of uncertainty about that as well. And what do I mean by this making sense for ancient kind of intensity since we don't have field tests? Um, and just one other thing I'll say on this, uh, on this slide, uh, in the spirit of this meeting, that the magic database is um, really essential for bringing these two approaches together um, because as 
uh, we're pursuing data acquisition, and as those data have been properly documented and recorded for the reanalysis, and simultaneously as advances are made in our understanding of uh, potential sources of bias, then we can go back and reanalyze uh, the data in the future. Okay, so attempt to, um, to address this issue of, uh, of gauging reliability in the least controversial way, that's what motivated myself and Greg Patterson um, to uh, write this paper uh, in 2014. Um, about QPI <laughs> criteria. So some philosophical statements here. So first of all, if we're uh, uh, acknowledging that there is a huge problem with uncertainty over data reliability uh, in the pen intensity community. Um, there are definitely been steps to making um, good quantitative reliability criteria. Um, and Greg in particular has been, has been working on that. But uh, at the time we're going to wait for those to become comprehensive and robust is potentially still a very, very long time. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, perhaps we can make some headway with qualitative criteria, because that's what essentially the paleomagnetists working in, with Pulse, yeah, for paleogeography, have essentially been doing for, uh, for decades now. So Rob Van der Boe's um, uh, Q criteria, largely uh, qualitative. Most paleomagnetists that you speak to seem to regard them as a useful uh, tool while acknowledging that they're imperfect. Okay, so something similar for paleointensity estimates, well, we'd have to apply them in a different way. Um, so paleointensities uh, or dipole moments have one big advantage, I'd say, over, uh, over directions in that they are um, individually, globally relevant. So an individual VGP from a formation is basically useless. You have to throw it away. You need a time average for it to be any use um, for, for more or less anything. Uh, individual dipole moment from, a, from a, a lava succession, for example, is useful in its own right. So it can be incorporated into a global data set. So in that case, then it makes sense that we apply these criteria at the level of um, uh, at a hierarchically lower level. Um, the site needs rather than um, formation needs. And finally, we've got a list of, of, of um, uh, properties of the criteria that we're aiming for um, and, and formulating these. So one of these is upgradable because as new advances are made, it's important to be able to uh, incorporate them into these criteria. These are the criteria that we came up with. There was eight originally. We've since upgraded by adding a ninth to the suggestion of, of Lisa Talks. Um, that uh, data are, I would agree, objectively more reliable if you can, if they are available for um, the research. Um, so essentially, um, uh, what we do then is we read papers in some detail and assign these criteria one or zero value, and then we sum up at the end, and that's the QPI value. The higher the better. Okay, so this is kind of applying that approach then to see if paleointensity data kind of makes sense in some way. So in the um, Precambrian, it's been uh, uh, there's been some evidence suggesting that a uh, geocentric axial dipole is not a bad hypothesis to hold for most of the Precambrian. So that's based on paleoenvironmental um, uh, data such as evaporites, evaporites, and so on. We might expect there to be a dipole, and we have some Precambrian. Uh, data that have associated directions with them. Uh, so we plotted them here, paleo intensity against inclination, huge amount of scatter. Uh, this is expected not only from the reliability issues, but also uh, from the fact that there are all sorts of variations and all sorts of time scales going into this. So that is going to introduce, uh, uh, introduce scatter. Um, but we were at least um, uh, quite infused to see that there was a tendency for paleo intensity, the average paleo intensity to increase as we move to higher inclinations. So that's in keeping with there being a dipole um, uh, relationship. What we're especially encouraged by um, was the fact that as we uh, incrementally stripped out the least reliable data uh, using these QPI criteria, that this uh, misfit from the dipole model decreased. Okay, so we're improving the fit to a dipole relationship by stripping away least reliable data. We're also 
decreasing the number of studies that we were um, uh, uh, acquiring our data from. Uh, so this is quite a big problem. So we chose as the optimal cutoff then the knee point of this misfit curve, QPI of three. Oh, great. Okay, so this is uh, those data then. Um, all these graphs show the same thing. They're dipole moment against uh, age for the Precambrian. And uh, all I'll say here is that, well, we see low dipole moment estimates at all time periods when we have data. And we don't see any high ones in this middle portion here. So we split the data into um, three different time periods. So arbitrarily to maximize the difference between the time periods, we're allowed to do that because we're not um, prejudging where transition should have occurred. We're just interested in showing, is there evidence for a, for a change in the dipole moment, time average dipole moment at some point. So if we look at these uh, three sections, we did non-parametric statistics on them. Uh, so it's not as many data as we'd like, um, but at least we're drawing them for a reasonable number of different studies in brackets here and these um, distributions using a standard off-the-shelf statistical um, uh, tool called model of Smirnov test are shown to be distinct uh, well beyond the 99% uh, confidence level. Okay so there's a, a recent paper by Alexi Smirnov unfortunately not here to present it himself um, but just as a quick summary basically he uh, argued that in this late section, or they argued, uh, co-authors, that there were some data in here that shouldn't be in there, that should have essentially QPI of zero. Um, there should have been nothing that was completely unreliable. And um, I don't necessarily agree uh, with that, but in any case, in the original uh, publication in uh, 2015, we wanted to check that this, um, this outcome was robust to removing individual studies. So here we've gone a step further and we've removed all the data uh, from, the, from Greenland, from um, the Mid-Continent Rift in, uh, in North America uh, that um, sort of co-authors uh, took issue with. And um, doing so, well, we still see that we have a statistically significant um, uh, change across this boundary. Okay, now off, problem with off the shelf um, uh, statistical tests is that they're not highly appropriate uh, for a condition like this where the individual data are not independent of one another. So they are, um, uh, we have a problem uh, that many of these data are from the same suites of rocks and they might be from close and very close together mm -hmm. in time. So we wanted to tackle that problem by developing a bespoke uh, statistical test. So rather complicated, I won't try and explain everything here, but essentially we're using as the, the basis pad, uh, pad M2M, uh, the longest, um, uh, one of the longest records at the moment, variations that we have for the last two million years. And um, we're drawing data at random um, using the distribution of data with so the number of data and the um, uh, how they're related to, to one another in terms of how many different rock successions they're from. Uh, we're drawing data to create pseudo data sets from, uh, from, these, uh, from this distribution. We're also rescaling models. So first of all, we, we apply a random rescaling of plus minus 50%. This is to check, uh, this is to try and introduce the effects of if we've got shorter timescale variations than the ones we're interested in. So rather than billion year timescales, we've got tens of millions. Yeah, time scales, and we constrained all rocks that were within 50 million years of one another to be from a single one of these rescaled. And then we further required all rocks that were um, uh, from uh, uh, from the same, uh, sorry, all samples that were from the same suite of rocks uh, to be from a subsection, 200,000 um, year subsection of this um, rescaled pattern to it. And then essentially what we did, having done that twice at random, we then uh, calculated the relative difference in the medians and what our ranges and we did the Smirnov test on them. And we looked to see how big these differences could be without presupposing any billion year timescales. And then 
Uh, we repeated that 10,000 times, we ranked the differences, and then we looked at our own, um, our own differences and found where they sat within that ranking. So what is the probability that they could have, the differences of those magnitude could have been found without there being any such long time scale variations. And these are the results. So we found that the mid and early period uh, are no longer uh, uh, distinct to any um, reasonable confidence limit, but that the mid and the late still were at nearly 99% uh, confidence. So we repeated that, again, taking out now this data which Sven uh, had issues with to see if it, it stands up there, and just about it does. Um, so we have p value of uh, 0.08, so at, at least the 90% confidence limit um, we're still um, we're still seeing um, a difference, but we completely agree, or I completely agree with the um, uh, with the sentiment of Smyrna Patel that we need more and better data to really firm up this this conclusion. That the one that have been very long uh, timescale variations, in billions of years, and two that have been a sharp rise, uh, happening somewhere around one to 1.5 billion years. But at the moment, I would argue it holds up. Okay, so as John said in his last talk, there's a very, very fast moving um, field, core evolution. I just want to show the, uh, um, the basis on which we um, uh, interpreted the sharp rise as being as a result of inner core nucleation. So this is a study by Julien Aubert et al. from um, 2009, two N member core evolution scenarios, one which uh, maximized the core mantle heat flow um, uh, at the present day and one which minimized it. So this one with the high heat flow, that's uh, got a <coughs> relatively young inner core, although it's not that young by today's standards, eight <coughs> million years. Inner core seems to be getting younger all the time. Um, but this one, which is uh, inner core much, um, much older, uh, 1.9 billion years. And then they took the outputs of these um, of these thermal models and they uh, use scaling laws from geodynamo simulations to argue what would happen to the dipole moment uh, in, these, in these two scenarios. And the basis for us arguing in a core uh, nucleation happened at this point was that a slightly less um, extreme version of the low power uh, N-member model. Um, so we have to shift along with the, the age axis somewhat making a core a little bit younger. But we see then similar patterns of evolution uh, through the time series. So slight decrease, sharp increase, slight decrease to today's, um, uh, the, the dipole moment average for the last few hundreds of millions of years. Okay, so that's all I want to say on core evolution. I want to move on to now um, uh, variations on slightly shorter time scale of tens to hundreds of million years. Oh, something's happened with uh, with this, you know, all that. Okay, this figure's uh, a little bit messed up. Um, but yeah, so so variations I've already shown actually reversal frequency. It, it, it tracks these arrows fairly well. You'll have to take my word uh, on it. Um, but essentially, yeah, there's I and, and many others think there's a very um, uh, strong likelihood that these reflect to some degree um, the influence of uh, mantle convection changing the core mantle, the pattern of core mantle heat flow, uh, and therefore powering the, the um, therefore influence of geodynamo beneath. And so it's tested very strongly in reversal frequency variations. Uh, in paleosecular variation, if you look carefully, I'd say that it's also um, uh, pretty strongly tested. So this is uh, in the Cretaceous normal supercron. We see uh, very predictable um, and lower um, uh, amounts of BGP scatter compared to what we see in the Jurassic, where reversal frequency was much higher. Here, secular variation was much more erratic and of larger amplitude. In dipole moment, uh, well, I appreciate that um, so Elizabeth Ingham and, and co authors did a study a few years ago where they, they took the then database and concluded that you couldn't say anything uh, about the dipole moment variations being linked to reversal frequency. Uh, I think that it might be good to. Uh, revisit this problem in the, uh, in the near future uh, because there's been quite a few studies recently that seem to have reinforced the idea that actually 
type of modern variations have occurred. So it's Lisa's study uh, from uh, an ODP site in the Western Pacific, um, and also um, uh, Courtney Spring study from the Shamrock uh, Batholith in Western Nevada. Uh, both Jurassic age rocks, uh, so reversal frequency is relatively high, both showing fairly low paleo intensity. So in terms of what uh, I'll be talking about now, we're interested in the paleo intensity in this time interval here, where we have very little paleomagnetic information at all in the mid Paleozoic, so the Devonian, the um, early Carboniferous. So there has been a recent um, magnetostratigraphic study by um, Hansmer et al. in the Canning Basin, Western Australia, 370 million years ago, they found lots and lots of reversals. So suggestion of reversal frequency was indeed tracking this, uh, um, tracking this dashed line uh, to some degree. Uh, also, limited paleointensity data that's there suggests that the diaper is very low. So we we're expecting to find low paleointensities, and that introduces some problems of its own. I'll just show you now some uh, attempt to get a handle on how difficult it might be to measure low paleo intensities. So this is very much an in-progress study. It's not been going wrong. It's uh, Joe Morris, an undergraduate student at Liverpool. So uh, we took an eclectic mix. He took an eclectic mix of uh, ubiquitous rock samples. We gave them a full TRM in a field of uh, eight microtons there. Uh, it's a very a low field. And then we took them out the oven and we subjected them to um, microwave paleo intensity studies um, like we would with rocks and got, uh, that we used a low field as well in the, in the paleo intensity um, uh, experiment. I think it's very important to have comparable fields uh, in these experiments so, but we applied it perpendicular and um, got some examples of some results here some interesting ones. So for the uninitiated we're comparing how natural uh, remnant magnetization is decaying against how the new uh, uh, lab TRM is being acquired. And what you hope to obtain is a nice, long, straight line. And these right angles, these are alteration checks. Um, and what we hope to have from these is nice close triangles. So this is nearly a perfect result in terms of its technical quality. So it's really quite interesting. It's actually quite an overestimate. But we're not really quite sure what's, what's gone on there. Um, but perhaps it could be uh, cooling rate effects, and it's pretty uh, extreme for cooling rate effects. Uh, conversely, we have over here this result, it was only just barely acceptable and two slope behavior, which is uh, not what we want to see. Um, um, but in this case, we are going to have something that is uh, nearly perfectly accurate. Uh, and it looks like this is an example of where the Tellier method is doing its job. Um, so it's getting in underneath the temperature, or rather the microwave power, where you have alteration occurring by temperature, and we're getting out of the less. Um, anyway, we've put together the seven results that we, uh, we've obtained so far, and we end up with something that's just about within 10% of the expected value, so that's fairly uh, encouraging. And also, we note that there's two results that pass all selection criteria, except for this curvature parameter, K prime. Uh, and if we exclude uh, these two, then we're actually getting rid of the two uh, least reliable results and improving this to within 5% of the expected. So that looks fairly encouraging, but this is idealized conditions. These samples have just been taken straight out of an oven and measured. In reality, these, you know, the rocks that we're dealing with, they've sat for hundreds of millions of years in a much stronger field, potentially. Um, so, to try and get some handle on uh, what might happen, we then took sister samples and uh, we put them in a cooling rate oven uh, where we were able to heat them up to 200 degrees Celsius, hold them for, for two weeks, so something in a short time aging process, and, uh, but in a much stronger field, so an order of magnitude stronger field. We wanted to see what this would do to our data. So these are all samples that, that pass selection criteria, or the sister samples pass selection criteria previously. And what you see, this one now, there's no chance of getting anything. Else. It's completely, completely curved, there's no linearity in there at all. Uh, the other two, well, now we have two slope um, array plots, which is unexpected. Now I'd say that um, well, we need to yeah, be careful of saying two, two slope array plots are never acceptable. Um, nature because if we're looking for low paleo intensities if we, or if we don't wish to 
completely throw out any low pen intensities, then it, it seems fairly inevitable that you are going to end up with too slow for eye plots. Um, and in both of these cases, and this is literally all the data we've got uh, so far, and so it's working in progress. Well, this one slightly overestimates it. It's not too serious. This one's not less perfect. It's a correct pen uh, intensity estimate. So there's some hope of obtaining low pen intensities. So our target region, uh, so this is the PhD of Louise Hawkins at Liverpool. She's targeting um, well, Scottish lavas um, uh, of Devonian and early Carboniferous age. Uh, but what I'll be talking about is the Devonian uh, stuff in um, Russia. And we've got three main field areas, one well, very extensive area. We've got the Kola Peninsula, Mafic dikes, um, Villary traps, Mafic um, lavas and sills, and the Manusa Basin, uh, Felsic intermediate uh, lavas and um, uh, high level intrusives. And of these, uh, Kola and Vilwi have produced paleomagnetic directions that are published and considered reliable. Um, the Manusa Basin, those directions are somewhat erratic. So we find some, um, some directions that seem to make sense uh, and um, others which are very, very anomalous, but which seem to pass some field tests. So they're reproducible in different locations and at fault. So I'm not sure if this uh, erratic behavior is may, maybe geomagnetic in origin. Um, okay, so some thermal results uh, here and a little bit of rock mag for you. So yes, we are seeing two slope behavior. In this case, this is quite easy to uh, diagnose because the steep slope actually corresponds to a very different overcoat direction. So we can ignore that, focus on this uh, higher temperature slope. We're obtaining outrageously low paleo intensities. And Wilson method also performed um, corroborating these very low paleo intensities. Microwave, these are some different samples. Uh, in this case, um, we don't have much of an overcoat of uh, obtaining somewhat higher paleo intensity. In this case, it's a similar story. Uh, we have an overcoat with a different direction, two slope behavior, and again, very low paleo intensity. And the Manusa Basin, in the story. So we've got the, the thermal over here, microwave over here. Those aren't the same samples, unfortunately, but um, we have, again, very low paleo intensities, with one exception, so moderate paleo intensity. And finally, the Vilwi traps. So these we haven't managed to get much out of in terms of thermal paleo intensity. I should say that the thermal data is all from uh, Borok Lab, so this is collaboration with Bali and Sherbakov and a bunch of other people from Russian Academy of Sciences. Um, so in the Billy traps, we've mostly got microwave paleo intensity. And um, uh, what we see here is, again, very strong two slope behavior. But in this case, the direction of the, of the initial part is not very different at all in the first part. So these made us, make us very nervous. We're using an easy technique with a field applied perpendicular to the MRM. So we would expect, if it, this is multi-domain behavior, to see some really quite strong uh, zigzagging, both in the uh, in the RI plot and in the, uh, in the Zydafel plot, and we don't really see that. Um, so one thing, other thing that we're worried about is possible alteration at higher uh, microwave powers. So we did one treatment that didn't involve any heating of the sample, uh, one experiment, uh, which uh, keeps sample at the same temperatures, a pseudo tele experiment uh, using AFD magnetization and uh, ARM acquisition. And this was all in somewhat more smeared, less too slow, but still concave results. Um, so this is supporting that maybe we do have indeed a stronger uh, component <laughs> over printing, a weaker component. Except in this case over here, where we don't see that concave behavior, and that's good because we also don't see that in the, in the microwave experiment either. But again, tendency extremely low and intensities. So this is a horrible table put up on the presentation, but there's a lot of information to get in there. I've summarized the data here, so we end up with so the axial dipole moment today, 78 is later, x squared. So we're uh, down to 20% or even 10% of the uh, full 10% of that value. PPI values uh, ranging between four and seven. Uh, you'll see uh, uh, given from all this uh, mag criterion. So uh, in part, the, the submitted data, we already put the, uh, the data online reviewers to look at, but also I'm really hoping on Thursday to get all this data up into the magic database as well. 
Okay, so just to plot these new results, so we've got one value that's um, approximately the same as today's, uh, and the rest all extremely low. So it's looking quite um, supportive then for, um, uh, for there being perhaps some of the cycle going on here and was having this 200 million year periodicity through the Panerozoic. So sort of uh, high pain intensities, low pain intensities, high pain intensities, low pain intensities. Um, but one of the prime scientific objectives of uh, the deep group is going to be to try and fill in this gap with reversal frequency estimates as well. So to really show whether we do have this, uh, this cyclicity. Okay, so if we do have it, then why should it be there? Um, well, one answer fairly prosaic is that 200 million years may be an approximate emergent time scale from mantle convection. So it's been um, argued by Nicholas Coltis and co authors that this uh, kind of period kept on cropping up in all their different models. So um, uh, the, the age of the oldest oceanic crust is around 200 million years. They suggested that maybe this represents some sort of instability onset in the, uh, in the mantle system. Uh, now, to turn that into something uh, a bit more, um, a bit less prosaic, uh, we can talk about that being perhaps linked to subduction rate. So, this is a figure that was produced by uh, Matt de Meyer at the um, Center for Earth and Pollution uh, Dynamics um, in Oslo. And um, so, he's made plate reconstructions back to um, the Paleozoic, and this is subduction uh, rate estimates from those. And we see two big peaks separated by just a little bit over 200 million years. So perhaps then we have an increase in subduction uh, flux um, that's sending cold stuff down towards the core mantle boundary at some later point that cools down the lowermost mantle, sucks more heat out of the core, increasing the Rayleigh number, and it's a fairly robust. Uh, outcome of geodynamo simulations that if you drive uh, them harder, they tend to reverse more frequently and give a weaker um, uh, dipole moment. Another thing it could be related to is, is superplume growth and collapse. So this is a hypothesis we put forward by Aga Amit and Peter Olson a couple of years ago. So the idea is over here, we've got, so we've got these, these superplumes of hot material that may be chemically distinct and intrinsically dense uh, down at the base of the mantle, but it's been pushed up by subduction occurring at its margins. That's leading to a heterogeneous uh, boundary conditions, high heat flow here, lower heat flow here, and uh, higher heat flow overall in this case. So therefore, more reversals and uh, weaker dipole moment. Um, but then what happens is superbloom rises so far, maybe the subduction weakens, uh, maybe it just on its own rises so far that it, it cools and becomes more dense and collapses again. Then you have a, a collapsing, um, you have this collapse and you have a return to more homogeneous conditions, lower overall um, uh, colorantal heat flow and therefore uh, potentially supercom at this time. And then a third hypothesis is one that um, I put forward uh, in paper with co authors in 2012. Um, so that true polar wonder might be linked to these variations. So if we look at the John Clausewitz true polar wonder model for um, the Panerozoic, we see that there's something of a, of a 200 million year uh, cycle in there, and that the uh, each hiatus really in the, in the true polar wonder can correspond quite well to when supercrons. Uh, occurred. So why might that be? How could true polar wonder affect the geodynamo? Well, the geodynamo core convection is not going to care about true polar wonder in its, uh, on its own essence because it's happening much too slowly, much, much slower than the dynamics of the core convection. Um, but essentially, true polar wonder involves the uh, rotation of the entire solid part of the Earth about an equatorial axis. So if the geodynamo is ignoring that, if the flow dominant flow structures in the Earth's um, core are maintaining uh, a locked position with respect to the diurnal spin axis, then what essentially you're doing is you're changing the core mantle boundary heat flow globally for in the, geo in the frame of reference of the geodynamo. So that's attempted to illustrate here with a, um, a seismic uh, tomographic model 
and um, the lowermost mantle, and we're just rotating uh, this pattern. So this is uh, expect to be uh, linked to part of the heat flow. It should be higher when the mantle is colder, when the, uh, uh, the side of the is faster. And you can see we're going to be bringing um, colder material to the equator or away from the equator, depending on which way we're rotating. Uh, this pattern. So what we did was analysis is take this true polar wonder model, apply it to this seismic tomography model, and see what happens to um, uh, to the proxy for heat flow um, in an equatorial region. Why in an equatorial region? Well, that's um, so again. I'm told by many geodynamo modelers that they would expect the, the geodynamo to be most sensitive. To the heat being extracted in the equatorial region. Okay, so what happens um, from this model is that we end up with a variation like this. Now, I wanted to check how robust this variation was. Uh, so one thing we can do is rather than using all this information about the um, about seismic velocity, we just make it binary. Um, so uh, um, the heat flow we assume to be zero inside these LLSEPs, these large blue blobs. At below minus one percent so anomaly, and to be constant everywhere else. If we do that, we end up with nearly the same pattern. And in fact, this is a very robust um, prediction because we can change the, um, the width of this equatorial interval, make it um, larger, make it narrower. We can change it from a step function into sort of continuous function across the uh, across the equator, and we still end up with this same sort of pattern. And it's an interesting pattern. Uh, because it does pick out very nicely at a minimum right when you have the high one supercron, and also you get this sharp decrease in equatorial heat flow and essentially the driving force for the, for the, di for the geodynamo at the time when you have the, uh, just before the onset of the Cretaceous supercron. Doesn't do a very good job at all without explaining the last 100 million years, but it could be something to bear in mind. And a key point to take away from this, I'm presenting three different hypotheses here. They are certainly not mutually exclusive. Okay, they're all linked together through mantle convection. Okay, mantle convection is producing true polar wonder by changing the mass distribution uh, within the mantle. So it could be the case that all three of these have, have a part to play. And that's a question for the, for the future. So these are <clears throat> the sorts of questions that we're going to be aiming to tackle uh, with the deep group. So we have hypotheses such as those I've just outlined. Uh, they make predictions of the thermal conditions in a core size. Um, so thermal conditions in the, in the, in the mantle and in a core size. And then we're now at a stage where we can <clears throat> put those in as boundary conditions to geodynamo simulations and make predictions about how they should be affecting um, the Earth's magnetic field and how, vary, how that should vary through time if these conditions are changing. And then we can take those and we compare them to improve paleomagnetic records. Um, now, I've put an extra box in here, so this is something else I'm working for. I haven't talked about it at all here. I just say I've, I've kind of addressed the three um, different tools that we have um, and, and in tracking these long-term variations in, in isolation, and that's really how we do things at the moment. But it would be a real step forward if we could somehow integrate those three into a single, some sort of single uh, statistical uh, um, field model. Okay, so I can see Kathy's something there. So maybe, so, right, okay, so I'll, just, I'll just leave up my summary slide then. Thank you very much. So there are questions? If you're still thinking of them, I could ask one. So I'm intrigued by your um, sharp jump attributed to um, in a core formation, mm -hmm. and your statistical tests mm -hmm. in, in analogy with Padam 2M, which is our zero to two million year mm -hmm. record. Mm -hmm. So if we look at that record, um, we see a difference in the average field strength between the Matayama and the Brooms mm -hmm. of about 30%. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered um, whether if you took those data, you would be able to attribute in a core formation having occurred at the Brooms Matayama boundary. Mm, well, that is, <laughs> yeah, no, fair enough. Um, that is exactly the reason why we use Padam 2 for those very because long time. Because the in a core form, form <laughs> Sorry. 
Um, because we have the, yeah, because we so recognize we that they're all very, very long period secular variation, variations, hundreds of thousands of years, right? Yeah, my, my question was actually a different one, and that is that there's so much variance in the records that yeah. we really have trouble pinning down what the variance is in actual field strength over, say, a million year time scale or a hundred yeah. million year yeah. time scale. Yeah, and when we look at Padam 2 and there mm -hmm. are, of course, a, a lot of records that that's the best time we know best, really. Mm -hmm. A lot of records go into that. Um, can we actually do the test that you've done with any reliability if we would discover that if we looked at pattern 2M we would find that there was a sharp jump no, in no, the field strength. But the, the whole purpose of that test is to incorporate those problems. So if we did that test with pattern 2M then it would definitely fail to show that difference because that's what the, the whole test I, was devised. I, I'm suggesting a different to, test where you right. take all of the data from the Matayama and all of the data ah, from the brooms right. and say oh, okay. is there a oh, statistical nice. difference between these two yeah. because there is actually a 30% difference in field strength between those two things which would be a different test but yeah. might also be relevant to your yeah. result. I'm, but I, I do honestly think it would, it would pass that test and it would reject the uh, null hypothesis of any long-term, longer-term uh, variation. Okay. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I'll get to work on it tonight. Okay, then. Yes. So, of course, there's a longer-term slow There's a longer-term slow approach It's probably much better people, qualified people than me to answer that. But what I've understood is I've heard different arguments about what the effect actually is of, of having the inner core there, whether it's, you know, there, there is this effect of anchoring, you're right, of the diffusion of magnetic field lines in there. Maybe that exerts some memory so that then when you get a collapse of a field, it, it recovers its old polarity. Um, but I've also heard said that the much bigger effect is a geometry and that essentially by putting a big ball of something solid in the middle of the, of the convecting outer core, you're destabilizing the field. Um, so yeah, we'd need to know which way to look, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Something that you did not mention, mm. you said that Yes. Uh, don't you see that uh, we have, uh, at least, as many problems with the edge than with the present quantity dimension? Um, so we, uh, yes, there are huge problems with, uh, with, with dating, of course. We uh, applied, so we used the age criterion, that's one of the QPI criteria, and we required age uncertainties to be less than, wait for it, 50 million years, right? So we're fairly, uh, yeah. we're fairly generous with that. Um, I, I do think there are big problems. I don't think they're necessarily huge problems for this particular sort of analysis just because, um, you know, we're interested, you know, our uncertainties on the inner, inner core age, our acknowledged uncertainties are plus minus 250 million years. So within those sorts of uncertainties, I think, you know, kind of age or estimates are uh, survivable. I guess I have one, one question about the robustness of the uh, scattered, scattered decreasing through, through time. Uh, in yep. Of right. And I guess I'm just curious whether you think this is an, an issue or not, but it seems to me that one thing that does happen in the dynamic studies is particularly uh, ancient. I mean, a lot of these are dikes. So that you're in a column that has multiple, multiple Lyrgenian provinces that are overlapping. And in an ideal situation, those are all these you can't take every, every diet. Uh, okay. And so a lot of times it seems to me that things are being grouped. Yeah. Be associated with a single large, large region, in group, uh, yeah, large region problems on the basis of this direction. Mm. But the outliers that could arise due to normal secular variation that are like far away might just be excluded and possibly in the Hmm. Okay. And I don't know how much, it's hard to evaluate how much influence that is on that 
Yeah. Yeah, and that would be so that would be extremely difficult to estimate, wouldn't it? Because you'd have to, because you know, if the original studies of those rocks were um, looking for a pole for a certain, yeah. you know, lodging in province, um, then they may not even mention right the, the fact that they've measured certain yeah. outlying directions yeah. because they're just assuming that they're. This is true of our work on the Panda or Higgins project that you had Kelly of Peru and Peru. And thankfully, they all look beautiful, but the equipment can't tell them what they can't tell them apart. Right. Even though they're very amazing, but the universe is sort of inherently a filter there. And there might be ways in terms of, and I know this is implemented in terms of outlier exclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are various. There are various cutoffs. I mean, and the only real safe way of doing it is to apply the full range from the extreme and to, to none and checking that your that yeah, your conclusion stands up for that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, because I mean, even it would because of the time delay. So the true polar one, the nice thing about it, um, that link with geodynamo behavior is it's instantaneous. Essentially, if you see it at the surface, your core will also see it at that same time. Whereas if you if you're just moving everything around, so this true polar one record is is based, you know, on uh, coherence of paleomagnetic directions. The fact that you know if you're arguing all the constants are moving together in one direction, so it's more likely to be be true polar wonder than to be uh, uh, than to be plate drift. Uh, but if it was plate drift, that would have an effect down the line on on the core. But then we'd introduce a delay because that signal has got to get down there um, through the mantle. Uh, so yeah, that's that's a that's an interesting uh, question. So um, some mantle models have it pretty short, actually, like. 30, 50 million years. The idea being that the, the slabs might not have reached, got down all that far, but they're pushing stuff ahead of them, out of the way. Um, now, if you do that and you look at, um, at Matt Dermeyer's subduction rate um, uh, plots, then that doesn't work at all. But if you apply a much longer time delay um, on the order of 100 million years, 120 million years, then actually you can make it work. Reasonably well, um, but yeah, I don't think I'm not aware of any mental models that have such slow sinking rates. No. Okay, then I think it's um, lunch time. Um, <laughs>